<laughs> Tell me, like, you know, we think that you're half Chinese now. Like, you're almost there. <laughs> oh, that's good. Wow, it looks like you live yeah. in a palace. <laughs> <laughs> I think some Better of the, now than never, right? I think some of the best interviews are done when you're not prepared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the way you grew up. Is that a question? <laughs> no, 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 it's not a question. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> we can get started. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Emily the Fangirl. If you're new to this channel and you're interested in tech, travel, and working in Asia, then you are at the right place. Go ahead and click that subscribe button so you can follow along with all my interviews, my journey, and just my general thoughts about life. Today is really exciting because I get to chat with my friend, Maruf. I've actually connected with him via LinkedIn and we've been friends for a couple of months and we've only done Zoom calls and we've actually never met in person. He's currently in Beijing, China, while I am in Singapore. So we've discussed a lot about you know tech in our regions. We've discussed about our future looking plans and our career aspirations and just all things culture, social identity, and random things that we connect on. So to give you some context, he used to work at a innovation incubator space at Day Day Up, and he got his degree from Wuhan University in China. He's a really great guy, and I feel like he has so much insight and knowledge about the tech space in China. He also has a really great story that I think most of you guys will find fascinating because he grew up in Afghanistan and then he moved to China with his family and he really developed a sense of new culture and identity. So I hope you guys really like this interview and just continue watching. Hey Maruf, how are you? Hi Emily, how have you been? been a long time. Do you want to quickly explain where you are right now, what the cool wallpaper is and what city you're in at the moment? Sure. Uh, Currently, I am in uh, in Zhejiang in Shaoxi. That's where my family business is operating. And uh, I came here from Beijing. I just got a time to rest. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just took a few days off and I just came here to meet my family. So it's I've been I used to live here from 2013 to 15. So it, uh, it seems like everything is so different. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, because there's so much development all over the place. And at the same time, I know like, oh, I know this place. I've been here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I think that's a good segue into my first question. Uh, maybe give some background of how your family moved over here. And um, how did that happen? We used to do uh, textiles in Afghanistan. My father, my grandfather, we have almost been doing this business for maybe 100 years now. But at that time, it was really small, like from within cities, we used to do this business. But uh, until in Herat, when we came to Herat, my family, uh, and then we started doing this bigger and bigger, and my brothers became better and better in doing this. And so at some point, because all the goods at that time would uh, come from Iran to Afghanistan, and it was not actually coming from China, it would be coming from Korea and Japan, so my brother, even though he had no, no English knowledge or any other knowledge, actually, and he, 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 he just went to Korea to make uh, some orders, uh, textile orders from there and then bring him to China. And that's how he had like his first impression of the outside world, going outside Afghanistan and uh, being on a very standard international market. And uh, so after, afterwards, uh, maybe quickly after that, maybe in two, three years, we opened a shop in Dubai where we were selling uh, textile products to uh, mainly um, Middle East markets. And then afterwards, my brother who was buying these goods from Korea moved to China, to uh, where I am right now, it's called Kechao, uh, right here. And at that time, he said the first time in 2004, I think when he came here, he said it was plain, everything was so flat, everywhere was these farms, people were working. And now it's just like a small yeah. Silicon Valley, like buildings all over <laughs> the place, crazy amount of rich people and cars, luxurious cars. It's just crazy how things are going on. That's how we moved to China. And then we saw the potential in having our own factory in here in China, because we, we over time since 2004, until now we've been exporting a lot of goods only to Dubai. But in 2004, uh, 2013, we received a very good offer from a very big Chinese company where they would uh, cooperate with us in, in start exporting our goods 
to yeah. all over the countries, all over the globe. And that's how we, like our journey, my family journey started to China. And we've wow. been here since 2004, very long, very long time. Like my brother feels like he's Chinese. He doesn't even eat Afghan food anymore. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do you guys call home now? Like what is home to you? I call China home, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. I, whenever I feel anywhere else, whenever I go anywhere, it's travel. Yeah. The only places I really want to go back first that I will feel home is China. And for the time being, it's actually Beijing. Uh, maybe because I've been there for a few months and I've just settled down there some, somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but for them, it's Kishau. You know, mm -hmm. when my brother goes anywhere, the only place he thinks about going like really fast to be comfortable, you know, just that comfort zone again, it's Kishau or in, in Shaoxing right now. But the home for me uh, is China. For my brothers who are living in Turkey, for them, I think it should be Turkey. That's fascinating because home, like to me, is always like where the people are or where I have a strong calling to a certain location or there's a lot of good memories there that remind me of like home. Obviously, to point out the obvious, you don't look Chinese, right? Like <laughs> to, <laughs> to outsiders, you're like, yeah, just a bit. I think like the dark hair, you know, <laughs> to like Chinese people, they think, oh, you know, he's uh, probably an expat or someone who is from overseas mm. but I guess at what point did you realize like oh I am part of this community you know I this is my home too like when did you start to feel that like that assimilation into Chinese society when I just came to China honestly in 2013 it was so hard for me to get used to anything here from the weather mm. to because in Afghanistan we have very dry weather and here in Zhejiang when I came here it's so wet and rainy and you know it's it's just moisture all the time and the moment you go out you just just feel like you have to just go and take a shower again so it's just yeah. so uncomfortable and at that mm -hmm. time there was a little bit of pollution so mm -hmm. i was like i had such a good life back in afghanistan everything was so perfect mm -hmm. family friends you know like and i just uh, had my high school time so you're just a young man and it's in a very nice comfort zone and then and I was teaching English and I loved to teach English. And I came here, there's nothing to do. And I can't communicate with people mm -hmm. because as you may know, not a lot of Chinese people speak English. Mm -hmm. So at that time it was so hard. And I, and I really hated every single day that I spent here. I, I was interested in literature and, 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 and I was learning English. So I just opened some videos on, um, because even YouTube, you know, was blocked. So I oh, couldn't, yeah. it, every, so I felt so, so closed from every mm -hmm. single perspective. So in some social uh, Chinese social media sites, I, I found some American guy who was teaching English and he was so perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his name was Mike. Mike, learn English with Mike, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I learned the basic pinyin there. And within like two, three days, I learned more than like 50, 60 words. And more people were shocked, like, how do you know these things? Like, <laughs> you, you, you didn't know anything yesterday. And then I was like, wow, this language makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. I like to learn it. And then I just learned by myself from just like mm. talking to my colleagues with my, and then I started working in a Chinese company in RGB, like one of mm. the biggest uh, textile companies in Zhejiang. And as I spent time there, at some moment, I just realized that I'm completely speaking Chinese mm. and I don't know how or why I was unconscious mm. of this progress. I noticed myself being emerged with my colleagues so much that I even forgot that I'm a foreigner here. So that's my, <laughs> that was my first impression of being so immersed in the society. And then, yeah. um, but then that was almost like a comfort zone. Like, you know, China is so big. Um, so when you, when you travel around China, mm -hmm. even right now, when I go to a little bit of a village, a smaller place where there aren't a lot of foreigners, people still do look at me. I still do feel like I'm an expat. In cities like where I live right now, um, it's, it's not a huge city, but there's a lot of foreigners at Shanghai, Beijing, of course, uh, no problem. Uh, so I, say, I think it depends on the which tier of cities do we travel to uh, that gives you the amount okay. of uh, being an expat in China. So my real yeah. being uh, emerged in China uh, or that I felt that really I'm Chinese was when I studied uh, my university. Two years, I had so many uh, Chinese yeah, friends and it was so awesome. Uh, we were eating and talking and laughing and everything was so perfect. And they would tell me like, you know, we think that you're half Chinese now. Like you're almost there. <laughs> they would tell me that we, we, we think you're Chinese. We think you're so immersed with us that we think that you're Chinese as well. So even right now when I just get in a taxi and I talk a little bit, the guys like, oh, your Chinese is so good. And I tell them, uh -huh. you know, 
actually I'm half Chinese and then he started yeah. laughing and he's like yeah yeah that makes sense <laughs> I've come kind of become I accepted even my favorite food has become Chinese right now <laughs> uh, do you what's your favorite food just as a side it's hot pot. Like hot pot it's okay hot pot. yeah yeah, <laughs> hot pot, yeah. So I, I think that I really just went inside the core of the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. culture and immersed myself within it and I feel really good about it because I know that a lot of people who have been who have been here since 1995, yeah, uh, and they aren't speak, able to speak Chinese or go outside by themselves. They just yeah. have a circle of own foreign friends and just mm -hmm. doing their own thing, like in a small box yeah. in such a big, huge country. Yeah. And then I've been able to open myself up and just uh, kind of what we say in Chinese, "jie shou," to receive this mm -hmm. culture. And I've been welcomed really well by them. So that's what I'm really happy about. Let's explore that more because that's such a valid point, right? Like you could really live like an expat and you can mm. do all the expat things and just stick with your, your own people. Or you can really live like a local and like you said, jiesho, which is like embrace the culture. Local exactly. Culture. So from mm. your perspective, what is the way to win a Chinese person's heart? <laughs> it, like let's say a foreigner uh -huh, uh -huh. is... It's like, okay, I want to make Chinese friends. Like, how do I gain their trust? Like, how do I make friends with them and become part of their inner circle? Like, what, what advice right. would you say? The only thing that comes to my mind, uh, they're looking at this question from two perspectives. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, let's say, in a city like in Beijing, where you're working in an international environment and all your friends and all your colleagues are speaking English, to me, that's not a Chinese culture. A Chinese culture is when you go to a really far Huangshan or some really far mountain village yeah. and you're able to communicate with these people and they're laughing with you, they're just so happy with you and they think that you've emerged within their culture and they're embracing you and you can embrace them. That is, in my opinion, when you've really, really been into the Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. So, And that only happens when you are able to somehow have at least a basic communication uh, tool, which is the language, the Chinese language, um, with them. So if you're if you really want to do that, to just embrace this Chinese culture, which is amazing, you the only the first thing you have to do is to learn the language. It's really important. Like it makes them so happy. They know that this language is so hard. It's not a just an easy thing that you learn for like a few days and then you learn it, right? So they really appreciate that uh, the fact that you've, you've you spent so much time on learning it. And they will really embrace you. So the first step is to learn the language. And number two is to understand their culture, which of course this takes some time, but then there are some general rules to understand um, about the Chinese culture or any other culture for that matter. For the Chinese as well, they have some, when they're eating, for example, with you, there's some small subtleties that you have to take care of. Uh, and then you have to understand and then, you know, the, the way you sit and the way you eat and the way you talk. Uh, and it makes them so happy when you use kaizo or the, the chopsticks. So the whole Chinese experience is actually not on big, huge things. It's on really small, little things that can let them embrace you and think that you've really emerged in their society. No, those are such great points. And I think this is incredibly helpful <laughs> to other people who want to integrate into Chinese culture. So thanks for sharing that. What has being around the Chinese people teach you personally? right? Because you're around them all the time. Like, is there a core value or something interesting that you learned or you picked up from them? And it could be like a mannerism or uh, the way that they perceive life. To give you a perspective of that, how are we as a family influenced by the Chinese culture? I would give you two examples. Number one, usually uh, we have translated, uh, even in my country, we have translated Chinese TV mm -hmm. series that we watch. So one of the first yeah. things that, that we as a family, because we are really a family oriented people, like if in my family, like this Bashiri family, my brothers, when we watch, for example, let's say something together, we really pause and discuss on some really important points and that that is being said. So this TV series was a Korean TV series and he is a businessman who is entering China and China used to have gates, like really nice gates. As he's entering China, mm -hmm. there's this gate and on the top of this gate, it's written in Chinese, of course, but it was translated that excellence is the best. So we paused this movie. We talked about this. This is a Chinese value. At least it's a, it's a traditional Chinese value that was written on the border of their country. And that means that, that whenever we do something, no matter what we do, if you're a worker, if you're a worker, a manager, 
subordinate, whatever we do, we have to be the best, the most excellent cleaner, the, the most excellent leader, the most excellent manager in that company. So this was one of the deepest impressions of the Chinese culture that we had. Like we learned this from the, so we associate this from with the culture of China. So this is number one. Number two is that to myself personally, one of the things that I learned about uh, Chinese are they're really, really punctual. Oh, yeah. uh, when I when I work with them and when I when I when I associate myself with them and then we go somewhere and their their punctuality is so on point that I, even when I'm when I'm about to late I feel already ashamed like oh my god these people are going to be there yeah. all of them waiting just for me so this punctuality has been really one of the things that I have learned Chinese have core values when when they're doing business they share it no matter traditional or how modern they are when you're uh, cooperating trying to start a cooperation with them dinner is mm. one of the first things that they uh, prefer to have with you yeah. let's say that I, I propose a cooperation with someone agree to cooperate with you or to help you they yeah. accept the dinner if they can't they just politely tell you that I can't help you or that I'm sorry you know just mm. because you know they know that this this whole thing is going to be for purpose and I can't help yeah. you with that so yeah. this is kind of a really direct answer Mm -hmm. to the fact that they can't help you or if they can like okay let's just go and eat mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the things that i learned and is uh, for me it's really interesting because i come from a sort of completely different culture i agree with you like punctuality is very important i think it's it, it, people think it's like easy to do but it's so like hard. you're respecting <laughs> yeah but it's also like i think it's like respecting other people's times right and like doing it as a group like there's so many meetings mm. i've gone to and like people are late or like they're like 30 minutes late or an hour late and i'm like what the heck so i definitely <laughs> also admire the chinese punctuality the other thing i wanted to just dive deeper into is more around like your your personal identity how would you describe yourself now what is your core identity i guess this is a very abstract question <laughs> because you're kind of in the center of like afghanistan and china you grew up in afghanistan but you also grew up in china and for me like i'm taiwanese american but now i'm in singapore so every time you move around because now you're like okay i I've seen the world in a different lens or I didn't see the world before this way. And even me, like I learned so much from my Singaporean friends as well. Does that yeah. help? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it helps a lot, actually. To give you a brief answer, I feel that I have no identity right now, to be very honest, because my, my mother tongue is Persian. I've been exposed to this Chinese culture for some time. And then I used to teach English as well. So now when I pray, <laughs> no. I pray in English. When I think, I think mm. in English. There are some other things that I do, the communication that I do most of the time every day, they're in Chinese, right? So I'm kind of lost between like the question why I, I, I think that it's really interesting because it's actually a very valid question. I'm kind of lost between my past, where I grew up in Afghanistan. And I sometimes mm -hmm. think that it was a dream. It never happened because the difference is so high that they, just imagine this, this, this scene in your mind that I was a child who grew up right after Taliban left Afghanistan. And then the, the government started to provide education to children. And then we were students, uh, primary school. And then we go there and then there is no chairs. There are no stationaries to use. There's basically nothing. It's just a group of children sitting on the sand or not sand. We don't have sand, just on, on the dust. And then there's a, and then we find, we used to find a big tree somewhere that, that at least give us some shade because it would be really hot. And then just a blackboard and a teacher. And that's it. That's all that we would have. And if we were lucky, they would give us some really, really old books, like as, as old as possible for our, and that would, they would be our books. And the interesting thing is that every year, at the end of the year, they would receive these books back from us so that they would give it to the next year's students. Like we wouldn't own these books. From, from that childhood until I grew up, went to high school, that, that's how we learned. And then the only thing that got better was we would receive tents from UNICEF and then stationary once a year it's also from UNICEF that's why I really appreciate UNICEF I can say that I'm an example of how of a child who UNICEF supported through their education program I'm really grateful for all those efforts that they've done and children like me and I'm not sure there's a lot of us out there who have grown up and then they're, they're going to schools. And then I compare it when I went to Wuhan University and then it's like one of the, uh, the best universities in China. And I see these students, these amazing students, these, these talents and these buildings, these education, these classes, these facilities, 
it's just impossible for me to compare this with what I've seen in my childhood. There's no comparison. It's, it's even unfair to compare this education systems. So that's why I think that my past, maybe it never happened. I woke up with those memories in my head sometimes. That's how it feels because they're so unnatural. Now that I've got used to this way of living after, you know, after 2013, now it's almost seven years. It feels so unnatural, right? That's why living here for such a long time and I visited Europe and I visited countries like Dubai, um, India, so, so I'm kind of lost now between the, the, the question that you asked, like where, what is your identity? <laughs> Who do you think, or where do you think you're from? Like we have a personal identity that we have, that we feel we, we are from somewhere. And then we have a password, which is like a, the official document. I really feel that for the time being, my, where I feel home is China. I, I would feel not really comfortable to go back to Afghanistan, maybe even. For the time being, I feel home, but my identity to me is unclear because as I mentioned, I pray in English, right? I think in English and then my environment is Chinese and mother tongue is Persian. So it's really a mixture of so many different things that make me identity less. There's not a lot of people who can say they have a life like yours or have gone through the same personal journey. It's very, there's just so many aspects to it. and. Um, to be honest, that makes sense, right? Not really having a identity, but you know, you kind of just collect the experiences that you have and you're a new identity. You're an identity of yourself, right? Exactly, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That, that's the other way to put it. Like I've become an identity because of these so many different, uh, different uh, experiences that I've been through. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of gives me something completely new, something that I haven't had. So that's another way to put it. It's like a new identity. But I don't know, my dad's a very big proponent on me doing an MBA in China for some reason. He's like, that's where the future is. <laughs> he's like, you should just do, he's like, go to school, go to, just do an MBA. And I was like, but for what? Like, I need to have, I need to have like a purpose or I need to have an objective. But he's like, no, just go, just go. Yeah. So he's, he thinks, I mean, I think most, a lot of people think that China is a place to be. And I do agree, but yeah, just like you, there's a lot of like decisions that come into play. Mm -hmm.